The world's physical geography, the continents and oceans, fundamental features of our planet's surface. But have they always been in this position? Just over 100 years ago, a meteorologist and glaciologist had a radical notion that the continents have moved over geological time. His name was Alfred Wegener, somewhat of an unfashionable type of scientist in Germany, a bit of a polymath. His theory became known as continental drift. Wegener published his ideas in a book which was translated into English in its third edition in the middle part of the 1920s. Now, I've got a family connection, albeit rather slight, with this story because I'm holding my grandmother's copy of this book. She bought it as a student while studying geology in Cambridge in the 1920s. Now, to say that this book was controversial is something of an understatement. This is a story of scientific disagreement. It's about prejudice and intransigence. But before getting into the social aspects of the debate, let's look at its geological roots. At the heart of Wegener's idea was the observation that the coastlines of the continents could be nested together, implying that the continents were once joined together into a supercontinent and therefore, to reach their modern situation, the continents must have moved apart. Continental drift. Now, of course, the observation that the coastlines of Africa and South America could be nested together was hardly original. Almost as soon as maps were made of the South Atlantic, scholars recognised this curious jigsaw fit. But Wegener marshalled more evidence than just the fit of the continents. He was able to match bedrock geology between Brazil and Africa. Indeed, through the 19th century, the old crust of northern Scotland was designated by many geologists as Laurentian, which links it explicitly to eastern Canada. Wegener also used the paleoclimatic evidence of past glaciations, evidence with which he was personally familiar. But perhaps the most contentious for tectonic models was the evidence from paleontology, that fossils of land animals and those that lived in shallow marine environments were found on distinct continents, now separated by deep oceans. How could that be were it not for continental drift? Wegener's notion, of course, means that the floor of the Atlantic must be young geologically. In fact, it must still be forming as the two sides of the ocean move apart. Nowadays, of course, we accept the idea that the Atlantic has indeed opened. And we know this because of the pattern of magnetic stripes recorded on rocks of the seabed. And they record seafloor spreading. Wegener, of course, nor anybody else at the start of the 20th century could collect or read the magnetic records. That began in the 1950s and 60s. The catch for Wegener and others over 100 years ago was that the direct evidence for tectonics came just from mountain ranges. It was about onland geology. That 70% of the Earth's surface on the floor of the oceans lay largely unknown. And the ideas about on-land geology depended very much on which bit of land you happened to live on. Well, time now to introduce our next Earth scientist. Thomas Trowder Chamberlain was arguably the preeminent Earth scientist in North America at the start of the 20th century. Like Wegener, he was a polymath with an interest in glaciations. His early work proposed the extent of North American ice sheets. Chamberlain's renowned even today 
for his scientific method of multiple working hypotheses, where evidence is collected dispassionately and used to weigh different explanations against each other. So it's data first, theory second. He was appointed as the founding professor of geology at the University of Chicago, building it into one of the foremost centres of earth science scholarship in North America. With astronomer Forrest Ray Moulton, he was an advocate of the planetesimal hypothesis of planetary formation, where a passing star entrained material that condensed into the planets, and through geological time, planets like Earth shrank as the debris compacted down. Which leads to Chamberlain's key idea, punctuated diastrophism. So what's that all about? He built this from basic continent-wide observations. Here's a geological map from this time and North American mountain ranges. But the centre of the continent is apparently tectonically inert. The mountain belts are where continents meet the ocean. It's an idea that Chamberlain tied to the fledgling ideas of oceanic bathymetry, so proposed this, as the Earth gradually contracted, it did so on wedges, oceanic material to the core continental too. And as these materials were different, stresses built up at the junctions. So that's where the crumpling occurred at the Earth's surface, mountain belts. And because the contraction was rather small, there was no opportunity for significant lateral displacements in those mountain belts. So, for Chamberlain, it was quite acceptable to have rocks stood on end like this. Diastrophism happening where the land meets the sea. And ancient mountain ranges like the Appalachians were sealed stratigraphically by unconformities. These unconformities essentially gaps in Earth history, occurred at distinct times in the geological record, and therefore mountain building also had occurred at distinct times in the past. Chamberlain refers to this process as diastrophism. And because the mountain belts occurred at distinct times, as charted by those distinct unconformities, the idea was termed punctuated diastrophism. These ideas were at the forefront of the textbook written by Chamberlain with his friend and colleague, Rollin Salisbury. This became the most important textbook for North American students at the time. And so the idea that the present day distribution of continents has always been fixed like this. So for Chamberlain and other geologists in North America, the Atlantic was a permanent feature of our planet. Central to their view was that North American continent had been where it is now, only modified a little at the edges, sacrosanct since the earliest millennia of our planet. It's an idea Chamberlain inherited from the pioneer of North American geology, James Dwight Dana, who, according to Alan Krill, proposed the notion of North American exceptionalism and that North America itself was an ideal continent. The notion of continental drift directly challenged this view. So therefore, for many people, Wegener's idea was really preposterous. So for Chamberlain the Fixis, tectonics wasn't really what the story of the Earth was about. But this was not a view held by geologists in other parts of the world. Well, the idea that tectonics can involve significant horizontal displacements was beginning to be recognised in the late part of the 19th century. Northwest Scotland, in um, Scandinavia, even in the Appalachians. But there was one place where it really mattered and that's here in the Alps where horizontal displacements could be related 
to mountain building. These are Emil Argon's famous cross sections through alpine nap structures, which implied that mountain building was no tectonic sideshow for a gently and sporadically shrinking planet, but involved large sub-horizontal displacements. Emil Argon took his ideas that he develops here in the Alps to the next stage, and in his classic treatise, La Tectonique de l'Asie, he proposed that mountain belts were formed by large-scale horizontal displacements, including this classic version for the Himalayas and Tibet, where mountains are the product of double thickness crust created by one continent ramming over another. So Argon completed his work here in the early part of the 20th century. But what really made an impact was when it was republished by Leon Collet in his really classic textbook and especially its English translation, published in the middle 1920s. And again, I can reach into my grandmother's collection of textbooks that she had as a student in Cambridge in the 1920s and find she had a copy of Collet's book on the structure of the Alps. And there are all these spectacular images and cross sections reproduced from Argonne's work. Colin recognises the significance of Argonne's work and that of other Alpine geologists for the ongoing debates of the 1920s. And he writes, I must say explicitly that all these results have been obtained independently of Wegener's hypothesis. That is why I think that they are a great support to Wegener's theory. So another strong advocate for mobilism in global tectonics. Continental drift, proposed as a global model by Alfred Wegener, supported by the work on mountain belts by Emil Argon, and promoted by Leon Collet, the mobilists. Advocates for tectonics and the dance of the continents. On the other side of the argument, T.C. Chamberlain's ideas. As he grew into retirement, these were taken forward by his son, Rollin. Rollin effectively inherited his father's position at Chicago, becoming department head, but had actually studied for short periods at Geneva and Zurich, so was familiar with alpine geology. Rollin was a structural geologist, remembered, actually misremembered, for quantifying geometries in the Appalachian fold belt. But what of other players who had adhered to punctuated diastrophism? First and foremost, Bailey Willis, another colossus of North American geology at the start of the 20th century, and like T.C. Chamberlain, author of an influential textbook, and pioneering paleontologist Charles Suchet. These were some of the fixists, the chief opposition to Wegener's mobilist ideas. So how did fixists, especially Willis and Suchet, explain those fossils, the land-living organisms that are found on now distinct continents. Land bridges, Isthmian links, narrow geological causeways that rose and sank within the oceans. So although the fixists were adamant that the continents themselves were static over geological time, they evolved curious arbitrary processes in the oceans. Now, it's tempting to suggest that all North American geologists were fixists, but that's not entirely true. Frank Bursley Taylor, like Argonne, thought the great mountain ranges required substantial displacements. He invoked a kind of crustal sliding towards the equator from the poles. But these ideas were summarily dismissed by his peers. So... By the 1920s, there were two distinct understandings of global tectonics, static continents or continental drift. 
In the arguments that developed through the 1920s, there were two central criticisms of Wegener's hypothesis. One was this notion that the continents were somehow ploughing through the oceans, rather like icebergs on the sea. And secondly, what was the driving mechanism for continental drift anyway? But hang on a minute, the fixes, what were their land bridges all about? How did they work? There was no driving mechanism for those. Well, that's the way in which many accounts of the great continental drift debate have been framed over the years, that they were somehow based on rational arguments. So more modern analyses of the great continental drift debate focus on the irrational side of the arguments, the drivers that cause the fixes to be so hostile to Wegener's hypothesis. And that's what I'd like to develop with you in the second part of this film. It's a story of complacency, prejudice, bias, maybe even bigotry. And the lessons that we can draw from this impact on far more than global tectonics, but resonate today in the 2020s about how we should conduct scientific debate. So join me for the second part of this film about the rejection of continental drift.